No. Never good. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Politan Crows. My name is Lily. I'm the events coordinator here. Um, right now, we're hosting a lot of uh, fun programs and events, such as the one you're about to see tonight. Um, there's a whole list of them. Um, so if you want to see them, you can go to the website, politics-pros.com. Um, before we get started tonight, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the first one, if you could all take a moment to silence your cell phones so that we don't disrupt the event tonight. Um, and we will also be audio um, and video recording tonight's uh, program so you can go back later with your friends and family, see it on YouTube. Um, along with that, when it gets time to the opening floor for questions, you'll see this white pillar kind of right in front of me. There's a microphone right next to it for some of you it might be hidden by the pillar um, but it's right there so when it's time for questions if you would be able to just go to the mic um, to answer your question that way we could hear it loud and clear on our recordings and so everyone can hear your question um, and then following the q a we'll have a signing line right here at this table um, so if you haven't purchased the book for tonight already we have lots of copies available behind the registers um, and the last housekeeping thing, uh, once the event is complete, we'll just ask if you're able to, if you could fold up your chairs and just prop them up against something sturdy. That'd be a huge help to us. Um, so thank you. So now that's all the way. Uh, without further ado, tonight I'm very excited to welcome Nikhil Goyle, celebrating the release of his novel, Live to See the Day, Coming of Age in American Poverty. Nikhil Goyle is a sociologist and policymaker who served as a senior policy advisor on education and children for Chairman Senator Bernie, Senator Bernie Sanders on the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions on, and Committee on the Budget. He developed education, child care, and child tax credit federal legislation, as well as a tuition-free college program for incarcerated people and correctional workers in Vermont. He has appeared on CNN, Fox, and MSNBC, and written for the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Time, The Nation, and many other publications. Goyle earned his uh, BA at Goddard College and a Master of Philosophy and PhD at the University of Cambridge. Uh, McHill will be joined today in conversation tonight by Benjamin Appleman. Appleman writes about economics and business for the editorial page of the New York Times. From 2010 to 2019, he was a Washington correspondent for the Times, covering ec economic policy in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis. He previously worked for the Charlotte Observer, where her supporting on subprime lending won a George Polk Award and was a finalist for the 2008 Pulitzer Prize. He's local, he lives in Washington, D.C., with his wife, two children, and a dog. Um, so please join me in welcoming tonight to Politics and Prose, Nikhil Goyle and Benjamin Appleman. <coughs> Good evening, all. Um, we are going to talk about uh, this book, uh, which I, I when I when Nikhil asked me to do this and, and sent me a copy of it, I knew the topic was of interest to me. It's stuff I care a lot about, but uh, I didn't expect the quality of the storytelling. Uh, for those of you who haven't read it, what makes this book important and, and powerful uh, is how he gets into the lives of his characters, uh, portrays them with empathy and in detail, helps you to understand the challenges that they're facing. Uh, and and helps us to understand uh, both what's wrong and perhaps what we might do about it. So uh, I, I'm, we're going to do this in two parts, and the first part's going to be about that storytelling, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the policy uh, lessons, the takeaways uh, from that story. But I, I do want to begin with with that remarkable storytelling, and uh, perhaps the place to begin is is just to have you talk a little bit about how you found these kids, how this all began for you. Sure, and thank you so much for being here, and thank you for um, being in conversation. So I s first started visiting Kensington in 2015. It came actually very by chance. I reached out to a friend, Andrew Frischman, who runs an organization called Big Picture Learning, uh, and I was interested in examining the high school dropout crisis uh, across uh, the United States, and I'd asked him to suggest schools for me uh, to visit, um, and he suggested I go to El Centro de Estudiantes, an alternative uh, last chance high school in Kensington. And I started going to Kensington, visiting the school, thought I was going to write a story, interview you know a couple dozen kids, uh, spend you know, a couple weeks there. Um, and then 
over time, uh, it snowballed into a much larger project. Uh, I spent some time there, went off to grad school, made that my, uh, conducted a full length ethnographic study uh, in the neighborhood, um, and then turned that study into this book. Um, you know, the, the process of writing it was, uh, I mean, I, it was it was exhaustive uh, in various respects. Um, you know, as an ethnographer, uh, and ethnography is essentially a study uh, where you uh, immerse yourself in the lives of your research participants to under, to provide a systematic uh, analysis of something, a concept, an issue, uh, a community. Um, and I followed a number of these young people who had attended uh, El Centro. Um, I, I met them uh, they, when they were at the school. They had uh, dropped out of school previously and tried to come back to finish their high school diplomas. Uh, I learned about their educational experiences, their families, uh, their loved ones, uh, their aspirations, you know, everything about uh, them as human beings. And, uh, and additionally, um, as a sociologist, it was very important for me uh, to not just provide an account of their lives, but to examine and, and structure them in a way to uh, show that they are embedded within a larger political economy. That you know, the, the conditions that we see in Kensington, the, you know, the poorest neighborhood and the poorest large city in America, um, are, are conditions that did not come about by accident. Uh, they are the result of policies and, and histories and political and economic decisions over a course of generations. Um, and so I tried to bring those two things together. Um, and as part of the research, I would f interview the, the young people. I, eventually, they introduced me to their families uh, and friends um, and just shadow them at their homes, uh, would just hang out after school, go on, go on walks, walking tours of the neighbor, asking them to show me places where they frequented with their friends and, and important landmarks in their lives, um, really trying to get a full-on sense of, of, uh, of their social milieu uh, of Kensington. I also spent a lot of time conducting research at other uh, schools in the neighborhood to make sure I was getting a representative understanding of alternative education in the city. Um, you know, a lot of young people uh, who have been pushed out of schools tend to go to the alternative school system, whether it is a last chance school like Kensington, like El Centro, or uh, you know, a, a virtual charter school, or even a more uh, formal disciplinary school. Uh, they have a, ver a variety of options, and I want to understand that at, at large. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a little bit of, of uh, the kind of the research process, and it you know, took on about um, uh, over eight years of reporting. Wow. So the, the core of this story, it's the lives of three young men uh, in this Philadelphia neighborhood, Kensington, uh, struggling to get through school to get started and on their adult lives against all of the challenges of their environment and, and their social situation. And, and those three lives don't exactly, they don't intersect exactly, they touch a little bit, but they're three distinct stories. Um, talk a little bit about those stories, why these three stories uh, seemed meaningful to you. Tell us a little bit about who these young men are and, sure. and what about their stories made you say, these are the three that I, I want to tell. Sure. Yeah, so the, the three main characters in the book, um, Ryan, Karem, uh, Emmanuel, now now known as Karem uh, and Giancarlos. Carlos, um, and I met them, you know, just around the time of 2015, uh, 2016. Um, you know, Ryan. I'll start with Ryan. Um, you know, Ryan had he starts off the book um, with the story of how he started a uh, fire in a trash can in his middle school, and that uh, incident let gets him arrested. He gets sent to juvenile detention, uh, and then he eventually gets expelled from uh, Grover Washington, his middle school. Um, and gets uh, transferred to an alternative for-profit disciplinary school called Community Education Partners. And I uh, follow his life uh, during that time by drawing on an enormous trove of records and archives uh, that his mother had kept uh, um, for many, many years. You know, all the way from school records to her notes where he would come home every day from CEP and then she would record his own experiences, her, her, his experiences. Um, and then even the videotape of Ryan starting the fire that the court had given to her um, uh, you know, in 2009, she had kept that. And I was able to use that to uh, provide a, a really, I think, intimate and uh, fully narrative story of what that young person was enduring. And so I, I, you know, I, follow, I eventually meet Ryan. He, this is a second tour of El Centro, as he would like to call it. Um, he had dropped in and out of the school. Um, and I follow his life 
during that time, you know, he eventually gets arrested as an adult for, for selling drugs uh, and then uh, you know, goes to El Centro. And I won't spoil the entire story, but his time after El Centro and his, and his, uh, and his career. Um, Emmanuel, um, when, I, when I met him, uh, was, uh, was dealing and grappling with his sexuality. Um, you know, he had been, he had grown up in a Pentecostal Christian household. His mother was deeply religious, con religiously conservative uh, and did not approve uh, that he had come out as bisexual to her. And so he was dealing with a very unstable home life and the fact that they had been um, uh, dealing with evictions uh, almost every single year, multiple evictions a year for, uh, for several, several years. Um, and so I traced that period of his time, uh, of, of his childhood, um, and later when he comes to El Centro and, and all of those issues come into full picture because now he's trying to graduate high school. He, he's just come out to his mother. Um, he's dealing with housing insecurity um, and, and, and all the other things that teenagers um, have to confront. Um, and I, you know, I think his story really illustrates a number of the failings of the social safety net, um, whether it's from the lack of uh, public assistance like the program called Temporary uh, Assistance for Needy Families, TANF, or uh, the, the uh, insufficient amount of money that people who are uh, disabled get through the um, SSI program, um, or just the fact that uh, if you're dealing with uh, a family, if you're in a family dealing with domestic violence and uh, your family has to break apart um, and a, a single mother has to then take care of that child, how the state does not give anything to that single mother to make sure that child is taken care of. Um, you know, all those kind of harrowing uh, predicaments that. Uh, that confront low-income families in this country. And then finally, Giancarlos, um, you know, he was very fascinating in particular to me because as part of the book, uh, I was following their lives, talking about the school, giving this history, but he illustrated and, and represented uh, the resistance to neoliberal market-based school reform in particular. You know, Philadelphia, I would say, has been a guinea pig in, a, in this market-based experiment, whether it's from privatizing public schools, to opening up charter schools, to zero tolerance discipline, to massive budget cuts, um, to shaping the public school system in the face of the market. You know, all of those practices have existed in the, in, in the city for the past you know, 20, 25 years. And Giancarlos came of age uh, in the, uh, during that time, he began uh, protesting against the school closures. In 2013, Philadelphia closed 24 public schools, one of the largest mass school closings in, in American history. Uh, he joined an organization called Youth Unite for Change, uh, which was a youth-led organization resisting against these, these policies. Um, and I followed his trajectory as an activist that helped tell a broader story um, about public education in the city. So in sum, you know, each of them uh, illustrate some history or some policy or institution um, and I think I hope, hopefully give voice to that and humanize them uh, by connecting agency with, with structure. One thing I really admire about the book is that you uh, told the stories as they were in all of their complexity, even when that didn't necessarily serve the policy conclusions. Sure. Um, and, and I won't spoil uh, Ryan's story for those who haven't read the book yet, but his, his initial disastrous encounter with the law turns out to have uh, you know, a little bit of a silver lining sure. at the end. Um, that school that, that you focus on uh, is uh, arguably an example of, you know, what happens when you uh, allow capitalists to get involved in education, right? The, the guy who founds it is the scion of one of the industrial families that, yeah. that formerly employed the people of Kensington, and he comes back with this vision of, of a way to help educate these kids. So I, I guess talk a little bit about, and, and maybe let's focus on the school and, and tilt a little bit into policy here, but talk a little bit about the example of that school and, and what you take from it, because that is not an institution that was created by the Philadelphia public school system right. or ever could have been, I wouldn't think. Sure. So in Philadelphia, um, in the early 2000s, uh, Paul Vallis becomes a superintendent. Some of you may know that, uh, the name Paul Vallis because he just ran for mayor of, Philadelphia, uh, mayor of Chicago against Brandon Johnson. Um, and he's been a kind of a, uh, kind of a villain figure in various of these school reform stories, whether it's in New Orleans or in Chicago or in Philadelphia. Um, and so he takes the helm uh, of the Philadelphia schools uh, at that time. Um, and 
there was an interest to solve the dropout crisis. Um, and so they began, this district began issuing contracts to alternative school providers. Not Some of them were nonprofits, for-profit companies. And one of the schools that I mentioned, CEP, Community Education Partners, was one of the schools that was given a contract. Um, and then, uh, so uh, the person you're referring to, is, his name is David Bromley. And he um, you know, grew up just out of Phil outside of Philadelphia. Um, his ancestors uh, were, uh, had run the largest textile firms uh, in Kensington. Uh, it's just a fascinating story because, you know, going back to methodology for a second, I didn't know any of this, you know, going in. You know, I, I hadn't known the Bromley family or, or, or the history of industry in, in Kensington. Um, and it's only a couple years into my research where I was reading a um, uh, history of industrial life in, uh, in, in Philadelphia. I think it was um, uh, Philip Scranton, one of the great historians of, uh, of Philadelphia, and I noticed Bromley kept coming up, and I was like, "Wait a second! Like, is this the same guy? Uh, you know that I've been writing about for all these years?" And then I went to David, and I was like, "Hey, David! Like, are you, you know, are you a Bromley? You know, are you, what, what, you know, is your family uh, part of, part, you know, are you, ancestors uh, were were um, had organized these textile companies?" And so he tells me a little bit uh, the history of that, and I went on this kind of goose. Uh, Goose search, uh, where I'm going all over Kensington and trying to find the old factories, and I learned quite remarkably uh, the school was located on Dauphin Street uh, when I was there. And literally, you can stand, you can be on the third, the top floor of the school, and you can see an old Bromley textile mill just next to the Dauphin L, uh, L station, which is kind of remarkable and actually something David didn't even know. Um, and so I go on, you know, I uncover a lot of this history over time, and even the first location of the school which is in Norris Square, just two blocks south of Dolphin Street uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, Norris Square used to be a, um, a place where many of the, uh, the bosses of the textile companies uh, used to live. And I learned that David's family members actually lived in the brownstones, literally across the street from the school, the first school building. So there, you know, it's just infused with this great history that uh, I just became insanely curious about uncovering. Um, so, long story short, David, uh, you know, grows up in in outside of Philadelphia, goes to private schools, moves to California, uh, and then gets into education all of a sudden by deciding to tutor at a at a local high school in L.A. Um, and uh, get you know inspires him to go into teaching. He goes on to start a big picture learning model school in Oakland. Um, and big picture learning, for, you know, for those of you who are not familiar, is a you know nonprofit uh, organization that has a network of what are called progressive or student centered schools. Um, the idea is that the school should fit the needs of the child, and we shouldn't we should divorce. You know, there should be a, uh, a divorce between the community and the classroom. So students spend several days a week in internships and what they call real world learning experiences, among other. Uh, activities. There, uh, there's a, uh, a structure of advisories where uh, students are um, in those advisories uh, throughout the day. Uh, and, th and the idea is that each child should be known by at least one adult in the school, um, which helps produce more social cohesion, uh, reduces bullying, uh, and also just make sure that students are heard and felt responsive to. So David comes back to Philadelphia, starts uh, El Centro de Estudiantes, gets a contract by the district. It was quite funny because he was telling me about his, you know, uh, his experience coming to Kensington. And it wasn't deliberate that he decided to start this, this school in that neighborhood. Uh, he only learns later on when he was looking for real estate uh, for the school that people would tell him, like, are you a Bromley? Like, are you, you know, is, are you part of that family? Um, and... Uh, he actually, you know, this. He tells me this funny story where he, you know, he met this guy, and he's like, similarly, "Hey, um, I don't mean to be offensive, but like, are you a Bromley?" And he's like, "Yeah, you know, the, you know I'm just want to let you know, like, I'm, I used to be a union organizer, and the Bromleys were the worst people <laughs> against workers." And so David, you know, kind of gets into this uh, situation, and you know, I've talked to him a number of times. I've asked him to kind of reflect upon starting a school, an alternative school, for some of the poorest children and families in the city in a neighborhood that was sucked dry of the enormous wealth that these factories produced for decades, um, you know, how do you kind of reconcile with that? Um, and, you know, I posed him some, posed some of these kind of difficult questions, and, the, and he, you know, he recognized the kind of irony of that and, um, and, you know, felt that he was doing some good 
on behalf of these children uh, living in very deep poverty. Um, and you know, even though many of them may not have graduated, um, and, uh, but he was providing them with a safe, nurturing place for at least a couple hours during the day. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that that sense of that neighborhood sucked dry. I mean, it feels like, the, the description of it feels a little bit like, you know, the high plains with all the nutrients gone and you can't really have a productive farm there anymore. Sure. You also spend a lot of time on, on not just the stories of these young men, but on their family histories, on the traumas that their mothers in particular, but also their fathers and their mm. grandmothers and grandfathers endured. Uh, and it starts to feel pretty bleak, honestly. Yep. It starts to feel like, you know, here they are, traumatized for generations, stuck in this place uh, where it's awfully hard to imagine anyone uh, prospering. Um, where do, where's the hope in the story, is, I guess, <laughs> is the question. You know, it is, it is a very harrowing book. I'm not going to, you know, try to, uh, you know, change that uh, understanding of the book. I think it's a... Uh, it tells very traumatizing uh, stories of, of great structural violence. Um, you know, just actually here at Politics and Prose, Tracy Cater spoke um, a couple of months ago, and he wrote an incredible book about Paul Farmer, the anthropologist and physician. And, you know, I, I followed and have been wedded to the uh, concepts of structural violence because I found that, uh, found that Kensington was the embodiment of that structural violence and housing, the lack of housing, health care. Uh, educational opportunities, food insecurity, you know, all, run the gamut. Um, and so, you know, I began to uh, try to understand those concepts uh, and, and apply them to these uh, young people's uh, lives um, and, and see that kind of be borne out uh, across generations. And it was very important for me to provide an intergenerational account as well because you know, I think a lot of, a lot of narrative nonfiction books uh, may not provide the larger history at play. And you know, as I was beginning to interview their mothers in particular, you know, this is just as much a book about these three kids as much as it is about their three mothers, um, uh, I, I began to see the intergenerational transmission of poverty over time. And that's the sociologist in me talking, but that's essentially the reproduction of poverty from generation to generation. Not because of what some people would argue are due to culture or due to cultural attributes, but because, as many sociologists would argue, is because that these young people are put in the same or similar egregious conditions that their parents were predisposed to when they grew up, whether it's the lack of opportunity in, in various capacities. Um, and so the question about hope, you know, I, I think what I'm hopeful for, at least what I try to do, and you, you can see this in the conclusion at least, is to provide a blue, uh, somewhat of a rough blueprint for where we go from here. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I, you know, I, I took from these stories, uh, and I took these stories and I brought them to, to Washington when I started working for Senator Sanders, um, and I, I constantly remembered Kensington when we worked on the child tax credit, when we worked on affordable child care and, and tuition-free public college, I knew how transformative those programs would be for their lives. And so I think that's where I see hope. That's where I see uh, the sense of possibility that when, uh, when Democrats had a trifecta, uh, there was this sense that maybe, just maybe, we could actually have uh, a social democracy where we could have, to ensure that people have a basic standard, uh, a decent standard of living. Um, so, you know, I think uh, I encourage people to read to the end because I think there is, you know, some, some hope at the end that with the sufficient political will, we can change and transform the conditions in neighborhoods like Kensington, the Kensingtons of America, um, and, and, uh, and make sure that everyone has a decent center of living in the richest country in the history of the world. And, and let's talk about the child tax credit for a second because that's a policy prescription that you've worked on and that you focus on in the book. The idea is basically that the government gives money, cash, to families uh, to help them raise their children to meet their expenses, the needs of daily life. We tried it during the pandemic for a year. It seems to have worked really well, so we decided to stop doing it. Um, <laughs> and, and that idea, you know, uh, a lot of people look at that and say, well, this would make a big difference for families in this situation. And, and I, I sort of want to interrogate that premise in the sure. context of this book, because reading the stories of these families made me wonder how much of a difference mm. would it really make if they had you know, a few hundred dollars extra each month. Take us into that. Tell, sure. us, tell us what that would have meant to them uh, as tangibly as possible. Sure. So you know, the expanded child tax credit was uh, issued in the American Rescue Plan uh, in March 2021. I mean, it's funny, my first day on the job was the day uh, the bill was 
was passed by, was voted on and passed by the U.S. Senate. Um, so I was kind of, I was thrown right into that, and then we tried to, um, you know, with with some extraordinary colleagues, uh, both in the Sanders office and across the Democratic aisle, uh, to make sure that that expanded tax child tax credit was permanent, at least on a 10-year basis. And basically, what it, for those of you who don't know what the tax credit did, is that you know it gave $250 or $300 a month per child um, for, for, um, to each family, um, and as long as the kid was under the age of 18. Um, and the research was very clear uh, for at least the temporary expanded child tax credit in 2021, and the way it dramatically reduced child poverty and poverty overall. Millions of children were lifted out of poverty. Food insecurity went down. You can look at the Census Bureau reports during that time. They have these great household pulse surveys asking people about economic hardship and are you eating enough? Do you, you, do you feel secure? And on every metric, people felt more economically secure as a result of the expansion of the child tax credit in 2021. And it was just a great disappointment to me and all of us uh, that that tax credit expired um, at the end, uh, the expansion expired at the end of um, December 2021. And so, the, you know, the question around, you know, is a child allowance or Spanish child tax credit sufficient to meet the challenges that exist in Kensington and elsewhere? And I would say absolutely not, no degree. I think it's, it's not a panacea. I think it would have, uh, it would dramatically reduce poverty. It would mention that Emmanuel and, and Ryan and Giancarlos and their families would have lived in more economic, uh, let with less economic insecurity, um, they would have been able to eat more. They would have had to get evicted less. Uh, they would, um, uh, you know, been able to have less toxic stress. The toll on their minds and bodies just dealing with the daily grind of of poverty and insecurity. You know, I think it would have uh, helped reduce the suffering and inequality uh, in in Kensington and, and all over this country. But it, it, you know, it's not, you know, I, I cite Amartya Sen, the great economist, where he talks about how poverty is not simply a lack of income. It's also a lack of uh, what he calls capabilities, or, you know, the way I describe it is the basic necessities for a dignified life. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's very important that we have, uh, you know, child allowance, but also that we have really robust public goods, that we build up institutions, whether it's in education, in housing, transit, um, uh, in, 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 in various uh, systems to make sure that people have the resources to thrive. Um, and many of those institutions exist already. They exist in the wealthiest communities in this country. Um, you know, take public education, for example. We know that the wealthiest communities in this country have really robust, equitable, well-funded public schools. Um, and their parent, and, and those kids, those parents don't send their kids to charter schools. They send their kids to the local neighborhood school uh, because they know that school is serving their needs. And so in the book, I try to make the case for, for really investing in the public sector um, and, and reversing the years and years of austerity and privatization um, and provide a much larger scope of what a, a, a social democratic country might look like. And I thought we saw glimpses of that during the pandemic. You know, I think we saw examples. You know, we saw the emergency rental assistance. We saw the uh, the expansion of Medicaid uh, to millions upon millions of people. We saw the expansion of SNAP benefits, you know, the, the emergency allotments that were given to folks. And, you know, we saw the child tax credit expanded. You know, we, you know there was a, a moment in the sun where we had uh, glimpses of, you know, are we, we might actually create a European style social democracy. We might be on the path towards that vision. Um, and obviously, you know, as you and I know, uh, that did not come about uh, and we have, you know, frankly, gone backwards, and people are falling deeper and deeper into despair. And you know, next month we're going to see the the expiration of the you know the childcare funding um, that was part of uh, the the COVID relief packages. And you know, there are going to be millions, if not more, people that are going to lose their childcare benefits. So I'm, uh, you know, going back to the question of hope. I'm hopeful, but you know, I'm also you know quite pessimistic, you know, about the the future there. There's a horrible scene in the book where a graduate of, of this high school is shot and killed right outside the high school. Uh, and, and one thing that struck me about it was just that he was there. He, he didn't, he graduated, he was mm -hmm. done with the institution, but he didn't really have anywhere else to go next. Um, you know, one thing Amartya Sen also says about poverty is that, you know, people need work. Right. 
to lift themselves up, and not just for the income, but for the dignity that it brings. Uh, and the absence of viable sources of employment is so striking in your narrative. Uh, you know, here in Washington, people regularly find internships for their children. That happens in Kensington too, but if the only source of employment is the drug trade, then the internship right. is working a corner. Um, talk a little bit about that aspect of it, the, the sort of absence. I mean, even if you get, you know, through childhood on a more stable basis and you graduate from high school, what happens next? Right. It's, it's, I think it's a very important question because in the literature on the dropout crisis, there's this idea that if we just get every kid to high school graduation, you know, we'll solve a lot of our problems. Like we would just raise the, you know, the high school graduation rates. Uh, that's, you know, that's the kind of silver bullet to some of our ills. And I think this book shows very clearly how the, just how flawed that thesis might be. Um, and, you know, like just the example of uh, this, this young man who is literally shot and killed in broad daylight outside the school. You know, he had done everything he had, was supposed to do. He had gone to school. He had graduated. You know, he had fulfilled the societal expectations before him um, and still could not make it out. And, um, and, 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 and that, was, you know, that was not an isolated story. It was a story that came up consistently in the lives of these young people where, you know, even, uh, you know, one thing I found just so striking, and, and maybe I can just talk about this briefly, but the title, Live to See the Day, it came from conversations I would have with, uh, with the kids. Um, in particular, Ryan, I'll, you know, I'll give one example, I'll give two examples. Ryan would tell me that when he was growing up, especially as a teenager, he didn't know what he was going to, he didn't, he didn't, and he couldn't envision what life was after the age of 18 or 21. He was either going to, he thought he was either going to be dead or incarcerated. One of those two things. He didn't even think he might have a job, he might have a family, he might have kids. You know, that wasn't even something, a question, uh, a, a possibility for him. Um, and then the second thing I'll mention is, I was, uh, another young person I interviewed, um, I, you know, his, his birthday, uh, it was his birthday um, a couple years ago, and I wished him happy birthday. And I said, how do you feel? And, I, and he said, I'm just glad I made it another year. Like, just, I mean, the astonishment like, of that remark. I gl I'm glad I made it another year. That this young person uh, you know, was literally living day by day. Like, he didn't know if he was going to survive next week. And, and, and that was, it just hit me to the core. You know, not just as a sociologist and ethnographer, but also just as a human being, because you know, I grew up on Long Island. I grew up in you know, pretty well-off uh, communities. Um, and there was never a question, like, that you're, that it, one, that you're going to go to college or you know, some, you know, do well economically in life. But the idea of just being alive uh, just wasn't even a, a, a thing that we thought, you know, we talked about. Um, and so premature death, the concept of that, the, the, how, how violent of a concept premature death is, is one that is found throughout uh, the book and, and one that impacts a lot of these young people. You know, I talk about Giancarlos and his best friend, um, you know, just getting the crosshairs of a shooting and, and gets shot in the back of the head and, and dies. I mean, just, it, you know, the, the conditions that exist in Kensington, um, you know, are, are just intolerable in that way. And, you know, it, Philadelphia has become now, uh, over the past couple of years, th the most violent city in America, the largest, uh, the most number of homicides per capita of any large city in this country. Um, and so it's a daily struggle of just even going to the corner store. Like, there were, you know, there, were, there, were, there was this one, one young person who told me that, you know, he, he was afraid to walk two blocks to go to the poppy store, as they call it in Kensington, uh, just to pick up a sandwich. Because the other day, a bullet grazed his ear and then almost hit his, almost hit his daughter. Like, so, you know, the, the toll that violence had on their lives and how the nav having to navigate that violence on a daily basis, and then trying to graduate high school on top of that, I mean, come on. You know, you put anybody uh, in that situation and it's, it's almost uh, akin to making them fail. Um, and so I think a high school diploma is frankly insufficient to that to the question of um, employment, you know, I think, I you know, one of the policy proposals that I will, uh, I'm, I'm a big champion for is bringing is renewing the spirit of the New Deal, the Works Progress Administration WPA style public jobs programs, because the way to actually disrupt the drug trade is not to just arrest or incarcerate your way to success. It's to provide people with decent, dignified living wage employment so that people have real opportunity in their lives, and particularly for people who have a criminal record. Too many folks in the community have a criminal record that prevents them 
from getting decent and long-term employment. And so if you solve that, that's how I think you really get to some of the issues of violence that's, that comes out of the drug trade, among other systems. One, one program that has been tried in limited doses and, and is successful but problematic in other ways is, is offering people housing vouchers that take them out of communities like Kensington and into neighborhoods that are uh, more affluent and more stable. Uh, there's a lot of research suggesting that that type of context sure. really matters. But it's also clear, it's clear in your narrative and it's, it's clear to anyone who spent time in these communities that the community has a tremendous value to its residents, mm. that they rely upon it, that it's not just their society but in an important way their economy. And, and so I guess I'm curious for your take on that. Can Kensington be saved? Is the way to help the people there to save them by removing them from Kensington? It's, it's a really important question. It's, and it's a question that I think we've been asking for about 50 years. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I, I spent a lot of time reading books of the 1960s. And, you know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan talked about, he had a piece where he said, should we be gilding the ghetto or should we be abolishing the ghetto? Like, should we be, you know, building it up by, you know, with more funding and better institutions, or should we actually, you know, make sure that people are not segregated and, and contained in one location? You know, I think there's, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of evidence, as you point out, um, of the success of many of these place-based housing vouchers. You know, getting people out of the neighborhood into higher opportunity neighbors, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest um, uh, of, of that success. Um, but is that a structural solution? You know, that's the question. Like, you know, that's great for a few families, but for everyone, um, you know, I, I think I, I would like to see, um, you know, and, and you've written, you know, very, you know, very compellingly about this. But the how do we tackle the residential segregation at its core by looking at zoning in particular, making sure that we're building affordable housing in other area in, in in affluent areas and all over, you know, uh, cities and communities. You know, it, it is interesting you know, uh, to think about this question, particularly now, because Kensington, especially and parts of the neighborhood are seeing massive gentrification. So you're seeing a ma you know, a, 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 an influx of mostly white urban professionals uh, moving into the neighborhood um, and displacing some longtime residents. And so you know, you're actually in, in, in El, Cent El Centro's first and second location uh, is actually safer than it's ever been. You know, it's the, the violence in that neighborhood has gone down precipitously over the past couple of years. Uh, even just the quality of uh, you know the fact that they're making sure that trash is being picked up, that potholes are being fixed. You know when when those urban professionals move in, the state, the city, make sure that they're taken care of, and before they weren't. Um, and uh, so that is something that I think you're going to see uh, continue and 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 you know push north northward into other parts of North Philadelphia. Um, so you know it's it, it, it's something that I think is it's a question I'd like to kind of explore further. Um, I think at the very least. Ending exclusionary zoning, building up affordable housing, not just all types of housing, but particularly social housing that's mixed income that allows people uh, uh, of, of all income backgrounds to live uh, among each other, um, but also to address like smaller interventions. You know, Eric Kleinenberg wrote this great book, Palaces for the People, and he talks about some of these very common sense place based interventions, you know, all the way from uh, fixing up abandoned lots and abandoned homes, putting up street lights. Um, you know, cleaning up trash, uh, you know, these small things that have enormous impacts on reducing violence. So I think it's, we can look at the broader picture, but there are things that, the low-hanging fruit that cities and communities can do today. Good. I, I want to open this up and uh, allow the audience to ask some questions. So if you would line up at this microphone over here, anybody who would like to ask a question, uh, come on down. Uh, yes, absolutely. Actually, why don't you go ahead and start while ahead. we're waiting for people to line up. Well, you've mentioned the, as a sociologist, the economic and other obvious uh, New Dealish kind of solutions, but there's also a psychological damage for living in this, and I think you have to work separately on that, and you have to make I mean, I can give you two examples of where the arts have had a tremendous result in giving people self-image, the idea that they can succeed in something, that they get peer support and all this. And one of them is in this city in Ward 8, the Baloo High School. That band is like a family 
to them, and those kids go on to college. And another one is in Chester, Pennsylvania. I'm associated with a, a policy where the, that's even worse than Kensington, I'm sure, because the whole city is a disaster. No schools. And someone has started a program there with the arts that's continuing. So I wonder, do you want to speak about is anything like that uh, sure. going on in these schools? Sure. No, it's a, it's a great great point. Um, you know, there's a great program in, in uh, Philadelphia called Mural Arts, and they, have, they build these beautiful murals all over the city, and they involve young people in those activities. Um, I think the arts are uh, a tremendous asset, and it's, you know, the, the unfortunate uh, reality is that too many uh, schools in Philadelphia don't have the funding to have art and music teachers. They just don't. You know, austerity measures, the fact that the state continues to deny Philadelphia its fair share of funding. I mean, it's just as simple as that. I mean, that, that, and you know, John Carlos in the book talks about how art and music were the reasons he stayed in school. That keeps kids motivated uh, and, and, and addresses, as you point out, some of the psychological effects of poverty. Um, so I, you know, I think it's, it's incredibly important, and, and that's just the bare minimum. Of the, and you know, I don't generally frame these in the, in, the, in the form of return on investment, but we know that these programs have enormous impacts, positive impacts on, on young people and, and the economy in the future. Go ahead, sir. During the uh, pandemic, you mentioned that there was uh, increased funding, which brought a lot of families and children out of poverty. But at the same time, um, there were uh, uh, masking policies, um, school closures, um, Zoom classes, and, and kids may not have had uh, access to these things. Their parents might not have been home to facilitate facilitate these things. So can you talk about what it was like for these families and these children and also um, for the school that had the uh, benefactor, were they able to ameliorate some of those problems there and the, the, uh, the young man that was shot, was, was he going to that uh, better, sco better school? Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think that so the, the young person that was unfortunately shot, um, he uh, graduated from El Centro. Um, so it was, you know, that was, the, you know, the, I think the, the- That's the, the better school? Th yeah, that's the alternative school mm -hmm. in the book that David Bromley had, had, had started. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, that, that uh, and so to talk about your, the first part of your question, um, you know, the book uh, ends just around 2020 or so. Um, so it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't talk about the pandemic, but I have kept in touch with the kids and, and folks at the school to understand uh, how the pandemic affected them uh, and, and educational experiences. And I think the research is very clear that chronic absenteeism is up, dropper rates in many parts of the country have risen, um, and the, you know, there's just been, the failures of remote learning are just evident. Um, and so I, you know, I think we're gonna have to deal with the consequences of that for many, many years to come. And for kids at El Centro who needed, like really, they needed somebody to handhold them. They needed an adult who was gonna care for them to constantly push them. Um, and it's very hard to do that behind a screen. You need someone really in person. And so a lot of those kids fell by the wayside when they didn't have in-person school. You know, I think there was some efforts to have like learning pods at El Centro where some kids could come in which I think was helpful. You know, there was one extraordinary teacher who would have class in parks in the, in, you know, in the city. You know, I think, unfortunately, too many school districts um, did not do enough to hold in-person outdoor instruction that, frankly, that should have been happening. Without masks? Yeah, without masks, in, in a safe way. And, uh, and, you know, and, and once we saw some of the scientific evidence of, of the safety of outdoor activities, I think there could have been, you know, there was a lot of federal money coming through and, and you know, some schools did use that to create outdoor pavilions and do other activities. But I think those, it would have been very, uh, I think it would have helped a lot, uh, especially for some of the most vulnerable kids to have something that was not just um, virtual instruction. Also, uh, did you draw upon your, your own experiences growing up uh, in writing this book? Yeah, it's not, I don't, uh, it doesn't come up in the book per se, but it's something I constantly reflect on and, you know, the been writing a lot about public education and, uh, f um, for many years and just some of the um, uh, problems that I faced in terms of the lack of engaging instruction and, and boring classes and uh, the fact that I felt that school wasn't always uh, the most relevant place to be. Um, I, you know, I saw that play out 
uh, in the lives of you know these young people as well. Certainly more ex you know intensified ways, um, but it's certainly something that I, I draw upon, and, and definitely this the inequalities between my own childhood and what these young people endured is something that I constantly uh, refer to. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Kennedy. Oh, how, uh, how are you? <laughs> all right. I've uh, known about this young man since I think he was in high school. <laughs> um, I, I haven't had an opportunity to go through the entire book, but I've had enough understanding of your career and some and a lot of your work to um, uh, formulate. I, I guess this question I'm about to ask. Um, first, let me say you you spoke about Allison uh, from uh, Opt Out in 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 your book in, in Philadelphia. I want you, if you could, talk a little bit about how you got involved in the schools. One of the things, even when you were in high school, and even when you were in England getting your education at Cambridge, I kept sending you messages saying, <laughs> you know, I want you to learn about the eugenics movement. I want you to learn so much about uh, scientific racism and other things because you had that, you were that uh, young man who, you know, had prepared himself to continuously and worked hard to continuously build um, in a particular way, and you had that consciousness at a very early age. Um, so I want you to talk about how you got involved in education and in building who got you involved, and also um, the policy, the, 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 the policies that you speak of. Um, In, right here in Washington, D.C., we, we, we started talking about school reform, how it started with, uh, how it started years ago, how it really centered around Washington, D.C. Uh, with Michelle Ree. I know the young lady uh, in the middle in the blue um, jacket, she just talked about Blue High School and the band. But we had something else that I actually attended Blue. I was in the math science program. And it was one of the best, matter of fact, I think it was the best program in the city at that time. And they turned it into a charter school. They took away the math science component from Blue and turned it into a charter school that was down Southwest. And that was some of the beginnings of the charter movement. And of course, the school didn't last once they took it outside of Blue High School. So the, the students there, um, we we went to any Ivy League school or any other place in the country that we wanted to. I eventually graduated from McKinley Technology, uh, McKinley Tech, and so um, I, I want you to I want you to talk about where we have an opportunity to go from your experience, from what you learned historically, and in the English school system, in the British schools, in, in the Brit, about the British system, and where we are as a country, and, you know, just from, talk about that experience a little more that I know you have. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think my background as an organizer growing up on Long Island and seeing, um, you know, the high six testing rollout across the state um, was quite formative in my own understanding and political consciousness. And, and then I would visit Places like Philadelphia and, other, and 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 meet actually organizers here in D.C. and in in uh, Portland, Oregon, and we'd all come together and we'd talk about some of the challenges of market-based school reform um, because we'd all been we'd grown up as a generation of the No Child Left Behind era, um, and and testing you know constantly came up uh, uh, in those, um, and it's something that Giancarlo in the book was was a was a great critic of because he found it. Um, dehumanizing that the the school was just treating him like a number um, and that the school's performance and their potential future to even operate in the uh, long term was based on uh, this on, on how the students did on the test and and so he called out that he you know engaged in, in the opt-out protest walkouts at his school um, and and right really tried to connect the standardized testing to the privatization to the austerity measures among other policies um, you know the the other the on your second question around you know just reflecting upon the various school systems. You know I I 
found uh, the British system, at least at Cambridge, to be uh, very in line with the way I prefer to learn, which was working very closely with two or three, you know, two supervisors, two professors, and creating my own curriculum and research agenda based on that. Um, you know, it was very similar to my time at Goddard, um, which was, you know, Goddard, for those of you not don't know, is like a very kind of hippie progressive school in, in rural Vermont. Um, and uh, where it, it has many uh, similarities to, to graduate school. Um, and so I, I, I found that those experiences prepared me for graduate school uh, very well because I was able to be, uh, be self-directed, create my own curriculum, work closely with mentors, use the community as the classroom, um, and that, you know, that was helpful later on. So, um, and I think many of those principles certainly exist at El Centro with the, um, the internships, the real world learnings, experiences, among other um, activities. Hi. Um, as someone who went to a British system like school in India, let me tell you at the school level, it is learning by rote. Mm. And it's only at the Cambridge, Oxford, <laughs> and the PhD level that you get the kind of right. uh, independence you're talking about. So actually, we are all looking in the other countries as to how to make the system look a little bit more uh, flexible like the American system. So quite often, there can be that kind of a thing. but. The other question is, you have been a critic of the pedagogy uh, in general, even in the good schools. Mm. So does it make sense to bring, if you were to replicate the best schools right. and take it to, to Kensington, would that help? Because if you say that the pedagogy itself is uh, something that's at fault, would it help to replicate that system in, a, in another neighborhood? Or do we have to go into something much more fundamentally different mm. to help that system? Sure. No, it's a great question. I, I, I think if you look at some of the most progressive schools in this country, they're usually private schools. Um, and they have student-centered approaches to learning. <laughs> Their teachers are well paid. They have small class sizes. They have really rich, robust curriculum. The arts, music, drama, speech and debate, yeah, you know, right. all the great extracurricular activities that I think kids deserve. Um, and I think you know obviously those those um, practices and those types of those pedagogies should be I think in the traditional public school system at large. Um, I I think when I I mean I would compare it to my if I look at my own high school which is a very high ranking public high school in Long Island you know, that was very regimented pre pressure cooker you know a lot of the kids they were preparing to go on to you know, they were being trained for the Ivy League or you know prestigious colleges and universities and it was done in a very um, I would say very distorted way of learning where you stripped out a lot of the joy in in education um, so and it's, you know, it's interesting you make the comment about the British system because yes you know you th that was exported to India and many other countries right. very very didactic rote learning and then you, then you go on to you know the elite institutions and now you're given freedom to learn and do what you want so you know that it's it's a very it's an important point that you made um, as well. And another question is whether AI would really make a difference rather than try to replicate mm. what doesn't work here. Can we just completely revamp it all with technology? No, I mean I think there's uh, I, I think there's a lot of questions that are um, still at play with artificial intelligence. I mean I think you know, we're we're seeing that literally right now, um, and especially with ChatGPT just coming out a couple months ago and uh, just the effect that it's had on just teaching and learning. I think that it will. technology can never replicate those really rich, authentic learning experiences that young people should have, uh, especially in the real world at large, whether it's project-based learning, whether it's internships, whether experiential learning opportunities, field work. Um, you know, those can never be fully replicated by technology. So I always, I always view technology as a, as a, as a tool. You know, it's, it's one part of it. Um, and can help or a, uh, help or hurt learning in, in different ways. Um, and I think th I always find it very problematic when we treat it as a silver bullet to our educational problems, um, and, and especially in policy debates. Congratulations on your book, Nikhil. Um, my question, so we're talking about governmental and policy solutions to the issues you're talking about, and I was curious what the perception of government is in the communities you're talking about. Because mm. there are studies that show that people who live in very impoverished, low-income neighborhoods usually have a bad association with the government, and that leads to declining political participation, like people don't vote, or 
um, you know, associate with candidates in any way because their main association with government is with the carceral system or mm. with the police. Sure. And so I was curious if talking about kids making it to the age of 18 was voting anywhere in what they talked about with their friends or what, how did government come up in sure. the conversations? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, you know, El Centro certainly made it very, uh, made it an essential piece of the curriculum that young people would try to become good citizens, uh, that they would be exposed to uh, current events and, and politics. You know, there was a lot of uh, opportunities for democratic uh, engagement where students could could organize in the school and, and, and push for certain policies, and the staff was open to considering their opinions. Um, they also, you know, there, there's one scene in the book where El Centro is threatened with closure, um, and how the young people at El Centro and the alternative schools organized an entire campaign uh, you know, going to City Hall, testifying, uh, marching around the, uh, around the city to, to push against uh, the threatened closure. Um, so, you know, and, and even, you know, John Carlos is, a, I think, a really textbook example of, of that and, and, and the ways that they took their own education in their hands and, and, and fought for their schools. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, the question around the perception of government, I think it's a really uh, interesting one. You know, I'll, I'll give one example. Um, to illustrate my point, uh, it was 2020, uh, 2020 and uh, the Trump administration was about to issue stimulus checks um, as a result of the pandemic. And I'll never forget Ryan. Uh, you know, he he knew I was politically inclined and you know would follow this up very closely. Uh, I had never seen him more engaged in politics than when uh, there was a question of whether we were going to get a second <laughs> stimulus check. Um, you know, he he wasn't going to vote for Trump. But I think a lot of people were uh, were like, "Wow, this is the first time that government actually like gave me something." You know, this you know the notion of the hidden welfare state. Um, it you know it was something that I uh, was very struck by that you know here you know they got so many tax credits and other benefits uh, through the tax code um, that they didn't necessarily realize. But now they actually had like a tangible here's you know six hundred dollar check here's a fourteen hundred dollar check um, that I thought was uh, very uh, that made a ma major impact in how they viewed government. Um, and I, you know, I think it had a, had a uh, significant role in the Georgia elections, uh, in um, the Senate, uh, the runoff elections, and how people were said they were promised that we're going to, you know, deliver fourteen hundred dollar checks if you vote for Democrats. Um, you know, I, I and I think the child tax credit is another example of that, where I think we, uh, one of the I think the failings in how it was messaged was that a lot of people didn't realize that they were getting the expanded child child tax credit. They didn't know it was this new thing going on. You thought it was, they, they may have thought it was part of the, the pandemic era program. Um, and I think you know Democrats in particular need to do a better job in taking credit, in like, in, in actually showing people that we did something for you. We made sure that your kids are fed at night, that they are not, uh, that they have a safe place to live. You know, I think there's there's just been enormous accomplishments of the Biden administration that a lot of people just don't know about because they don't necessarily see it or they don't know about it in their in their daily lives. So I think the importance of uh, of making those programs very tangible uh, is is a task that I think we all should uh, be involved with and, and reducing the kind of bureaucratic nonsense of the welfare state that unfortunately prevents a lot of people from getting uh, public assistance and the benefits that they are entitled to. But Ryan in particular has this fascinating relationship with government, right? He dreams of working in government right. as a police officer. He yeah. ends up working in government. He uses the government <laughs> to go see football games and you know, right. I mean, he's got a really interesting relationship. Yeah, it's funny because, uh, and I, I won't spoil the end, but like, you know, he does, he, he eventually ends up working in, in the criminal justice system. Um, and uh, so he has this, this, uh, uh, this, this kind of love-hate relationship because his life, especially his childhood and, and beyond, uh, was at least the criminalization of a child was a product of government policy. And now he's you know part of the system. I mean, you know, today he's you know he's, he's a youth uh, advocate among other roles that he has, uh, where he's working with many of the same kids, uh, many of the kids who were in the same predicament that he was in um, as a kid. Um, so uh, yeah, it's 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 a fa it's a fascinating uh, uh, exchange there um, between those two systems. Oh, well, I think. Oh, well, last question. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Since nobody has, I'm. Um, 
let me ask this question. Let me go straight to the heart. Um, I just found out that you were uh, that you grew up in Long Island, so you grew up at uh, the home of Cold Spring Harbor. <laughs> uh, and most people don't know that's the that's the home of the uh, eugenics movement in this country. But when we look at progressive policy, uh, a lot of people don't understand that housing policy is school policy. That our housing policy that came out of the American Economic Association, uh, where most of those individuals had the scientific, uh, scientific racism beliefs, created communities where people couldn't go to school together. It's, it's what created segregation. They created these communities where people would not be able to get a quality education because everyone would be uh, centered, all the, all the low economic people would be centered all across the country in these neighborhoods. So our whole, uh, our whole country was built on these particular uh, ideas. So now we know, and I, and I think, again, my friend in the blue jacket was saying what she said earlier, because we, it's not brain science, what's works with kids. Arts, science, math, giving them quality uh, music. I mean, Project Zero has been, uh, out of Harvard, has been one of the best programs in the country for years. So we've seen what works, but yet we invest in completely opposite things that don't work with children the market-based schools we know testing is what testing was kept used to keep people out of opportunities not to give people opportunities that's why they created testing school testing in the first place so what can we do to make this and i know you might you might be a, a, social, a social democrat um or a socialist uh more more inclined what can we do to make the sweeping changes for the next generation? Sure. What, what can we do to make yeah. the sweeping changes so the next generation could have hope that there's going to be something for them? Right. No, thank you. I, I think, you know, I, I think there's a number of things, and I'll you know, elaborate on that uh, in, in another context. But I think joining social movements, getting involved in the political process, working for government, um, you know, uh, Making it very clear to your public officials and uh, servants that uh, that you want an anti-poverty, uh, pro-economic security agenda on the table, um, helping to unionize and, and organize your workplaces. You know those types of tangible things. I think will make a major difference in in people's lives. Um, I think politics is frankly a, a matter of life and death, um, and it determines who lives and who dies. So, and I think we need to be we need to recognize that first and foremost, and we also need to craft our the way we live. Uh, in that in that way, so that we put pressure uh, on uh, the people in power um, to provide equitable and decent resources to the most vulnerable members of our society. 